this is how I would go about opening up a punk record label out of my bedroom. In fact, any record label. This is exactly how I would go about doing it. I hope you enjoy. And big shout out to Houston. He's through. He's in this video the whole time. Check him out. He does have a record label. He does. He is in a band. His name's Houston. It's the Houston and the Dirty Rats. Check him out. Somebody asked me a question in the comments. Yes. And I was like, no way. They want to know a real business thing from me. A business thing. <laughs> from me. <laughs> they asked me how to start a punk record label from their bedroom. Okay. I have to assume the person's got to be 16 to 25. Okay. That's a good age bracket. Right? Yeah. I mean, because if you're older than 25 and you want to start it, you better know some real people. <laughs> it's right? true. It's true. It's true. <laughs> but at 16 to 25, you can go to all these shows, hook up with bands, chill out. It's, it's, I'm 40, dude. I am 40 <laughs> years old. I'm 41. I can't do all of that. But I do know how to do business. And this is the man, he already has his own punk record label. He does it, he does it differently. I wrote this whole sucker out. So I'm going to read from my paper because I'm too dumb to remember all of this. Trust me. <laughs> How to start a punk record label in your bedroom. First off, you need to know exactly what a major label does for its bands. Do you know what a major label does for its bands? Um, like a major label, they get you radio airplay, they get you distribution. Um, you need to speak up. Okay, they get you radio airplay, they get you distribution, they, uh, they book you tours, they'll normally get you like a booking agent. And then also major labels will give you sometimes cash advances for your records. Money? Which is money. They'll give you money up front. So that's stuff that major labels do. Here's, here's what I feel a major label would do for a band. Okay. A record label is pretty much in charge of getting the rec record distributed, of course. Plus, let's not forget about press releases, tours. Um. Pretty much the job of a record, uh, a major record label is to make sure that the band concentrates on the music and everything flows like a business. That's my opinion of it. Oh, it's true, because then the, I, you're just the artist, you're the puppet, quote yes. unquote, you're just a puppet. And sometimes, and, <laughs> and they'll treat you like a puppet, <laughs> just saying. <laughs> now, on to a bedroom record label startup. Okay. First things first. What can you offer a band that they can't do themselves? Interesting question, right? Yeah, in the 21st century, yeah. <laughs> now, what I wrote down on my piece of paper is, think about it, write down on a piece of paper what you can exactly do because that will be the core of your business. Mm -hmm. Whatever you can offer, any type of independent band, or it doesn't necessarily have to be a punk band, it could be any type of band. That's the core of your business. Exactly. Do you agree? Exactly. It's what you could offer that artist, and that's why they're choosing to sign with you. Absolutely. Now, I have eight steps written down here. Eight steps? Eight Whoa. freaking steps. Number that's one. That's this many. <laughs> that's too many. Holy <laughs> crap. How the hell did I move on to a second hand? I got eight on one. See? <laughs> I don't know. Extra fingers. I like didn't put them on my toes. Now, number one, getting ready for exposure. Number one is the most, the most important step of all of them, by far. I have written down here, go on to Facebook, find every single Facebook group that has anything to do with your type of music. Now hold on, because there's more. Not just Facebook. You gotta find every reviewer who's ever wrote a review in their freaking lives. Now this is before you even have anything going. You need to know who does what, where, when, and why. Find every podcast. Find anybody who's willing to listen to you and do a write-up. I don't care if it's your grandmother. Do you agree with number one? I agree 100%. That's the best thing that um, 
a label and even an independent artist can do for themselves. Exposure. Exposure. A hundred percent. Now, now here's the thing though. If you're done with this in two weeks, you didn't do a good enough job. Definitely. Yeah. If you think after two hours of working on a computer and you have a hundred groups, you did okay? No. Absolutely not. Give up now. You need to find every, and I am talking every, not in this country, in this country, I don't care where. Push it. Find every freaking one. A month or two minimum on finding them. And you're going to keep going with that for the rest of your career. That's number one. And the most important step ever. Number two, your record label name. What are you going to name your label? Do you know why this is the most important? You have to buy the dot com. You buy your domain name before you announce your record label name. If you don't, it is going to cost you big bucks the next time. Do you agree? I agree. Because that's definitely thinking ahead. Just like uh, if you develop a logo for it or whatever, you have to copyright it. You always want to make sure that a lot of your pre-business affairs are all set when you're starting a business because you can cause issues later when there's like a lawsuit because maybe there's another business or mm. you want to definitely have it because it's just like the oh man i can't think of the actor but it was the whole the go daddy thing john malkovich yes. it was like he wanted john malkovich.com and he couldn't get john malkovich.com because it was already taken you know so you definitely always want to make sure that you get the dot com so i got a very important question yeah. do you have rodenturerecords.com um Maybe. I might have everything else, all of the above. If he doesn't have this, by the time this video goes up, I will own the rights to it. <laughs> because it's fair game. <laughs> Anybody can buy it. Don't worry, I'll sell it to you at a discount. Okay. How's 30 grand sound? <laughs> That's the way the world works. It's true, it's true. So, realistically... You have to buy the domain name before and make sure it's available before you announce your record label name. Your name is what you have. Your name is what your reputation is based upon. It's true. If you don't have your name, what's the point? You agree with number two? I agree. I mean, it, it, that goes with all business affairs regarding your name. Just like you want to make sure that there's not, especially in the technological age, you want to make sure that another artist even when it comes to not just the label, you want to make sure that another, there's not another name of that. Because it just causes issues. Like, it could cause a lawsuit, and then even if people just want to tag you on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, if there's, like, five or ten other labels with your name, it's going to affect your business. Because people aren't going to know which one's the right one. Yeah. So you want to have an original and own all the rights. So, that's step number two. Now... Step number three has a lot to do with Houston and the Dirty Rats. Number three is based off of my favorite punk band in the whole wide world. <laughs> Houston and the Dirty Rats. That's Houston. Check this out. Finding your first band is number three. How do you do that? Well, hang out with the band is completely different than business with the band. Business is business. Friends are friends. You really don't want to be friends with your person you're going to go into business with. You just don't. It, it works, but it doesn't. There's always going to be a conflict later down the line. Trust me. But young bands have huge dreams normally, and they expect their first couple of songs to go huge. And then they realize they don't. And it sinks. And they get a thousand views on a video and they're happy. They get 2,000 views on a video, they're happy. Realistically, they're expecting 10, 15, 20,000. I gotta ask you, were you expecting 10, 15, 20,000 on your first one? Or were you happy five people watched it? I'm, I'm a weird person, okay? I just was happy. Yeah, speak to the mic, man. Speak I'm a weird person. I just wanted anybody to watch my band, you know? I, <laughs> but I would say most. It, most millennials, I'm not calling you out, it's just a real thing. Most millennials want, if they're not getting a million hits on their first music video, they're thinking they failed. 
You know? It's very true. true. It's very true. Now, what you want to look for in your first band is they have to be like brothers. You don't want brothers. You want them to be like brothers. So they're family, but they're not really family. Otherwise, there could be huge fights and it could get insane. That's what Houston and the Dirty Rats had. Do you agree? 100%. We've known each other forever. Forever. Like, like... Forever. <laughs> now, in order to sign them, they want 100 people to show up and only 20 show up at their shows, which sucks. And you know that feeling. 100%. <laughs> I, even, I even know that feeling and I'm not in the damn band. I host a lot of shows and 20 people show up. And all I want is 100 people to show up. And it's like, what have I done wrong? And that's always what you're thinking. What have I done wrong? When in actuality, it's a new band and you're starting out. So you have to push and keep pushing until you reach 100 people. How would you get 100 people to show up for this band that you want to sign? It's another question, right? You've got to make sure that the band is actually into what they're promoting. And they don't waver from their core points in a band as well. Otherwise, there's no point in signing a band. You disagree? No, 100%. It's like Houston, you're a damn punk. If you turned around and you started singing nothing but love songs <laughs> with, a, with, with, with a harp, I'm sorry, dude. Like, well, it's true. It's also, it affects the fan base. I think that a lot of times bands, like, as musicians, they want to do different creative ventures, which is important. But you have to have certain parameters. Like, you can't lose the heart of the band. Because the Beatles experimented a lot. I mean, sure, I love punk rock, but I'm, I love the Beatles. And it all sounds like the Beatles. It may not be exactly like the early Beatles, but it doesn't not sound like the Beatles. And that's a good, that's a good kind of, uh, I guess, like, metric to kind of use as a basis. Because some bands, though, it's like... like I'm not going to name any names, but there's a lot of popular bands that over the years, and what they were doing 10, 20 years ago, they're not doing now. Your first band, you have to make sure, is that our backbone? You have to make sure they're super active, willing to tour, and do interviews. If they aren't willing to do all of that, or they're uncomfortable doing that, do not pick them for your first band, because you don't have the experience to get them to do these things. And it's just going to cause conflicts. So make sure they're super hardcore into what they're talking about. Number four. No, no. Four. Four. <laughs> right. Number four. Recording. There are plenty of home st studios around the world nowadays. You can literally go in anybody's house and practically record a song. But if you think it will help, Finding a professional recording studio to work with your label on the off times, it doesn't hurt to ask, people say, but it, it does hurt to ask. Nobody wants to hear that. Oh, you know, can I get a discount if I come in on the off times? You have to be good as you're, as you're representing yourself and your record label at social engineering. You have to figure out a way to ask them for the discount without saying it doesn't hurt to ask. We here at this record store will tell you it hurts to ask for a discount. The money goes to our families, just like a record studio. A professional record studio nowadays, you're not going to Capitol and recording. You can't. You may think you can, but you can't. So you have to go to a professional who's going to do the mastering, the engineering, the whole nine yards. Right? It's true. You, and it's honestly, I'll say from, from uh, experience, because I've worked with multiple different engineers over the years. And in some ways, I think I could have saved a lot of money if I would have just known the right place to go. And I would have known the right person to use. And sometimes, again, you could say that I, I learned the hard way and there is no easy way. But there's a lot of musicians out there that sometimes they just go to a high-end studio and they spend like a little bit more, but they get 
and we'll get a good product. And that's the music, what it comes down to at the end of the day. That's why number one is super, super important. So Houston, how do you go about getting a home recording done? <laughs> well, I would say it's like, if you, you need to find the right person. Because sometimes just because you have a good friend that says, oh man, I could record you guys and make it sound awesome, it's not always going to sound awesome. You know, it, it might sound okay, it might be a decent, de decent demo, but then sometimes that person that you go to see, they might have, like, let's say, like, they, they thought that their product was worth a certain amount, and then you keep paying that hourly rate, and then just start stacking up and stacking up. And then at the end of the day, when you look at what you recorded, you're not always like, man, I wish I could have done better. And you, and you could have spent maybe double what you spent or the same amount at a nice studio and it and saved a lot of money. But home recording is a viable option. And if you do meet the right people that know what they're doing, it could, could be a guy that works at some really expensive studio. And as Charlie said, working in the off hours, the guy that works at the expensive studio might have a home studio. Most of them do. Most of them do. And he'll give you a better rate as a home studio, and he's the guy that works at the major labor fancy studio, and you get the same product at his house for a lower rate because he doesn't have the overhead of the expensive studio. So it's a home recording, but it's not just some dude that has a tape recorder in his basement that you drink beer with on Saturday. You know, like... That's not who you want to go that's to. That's not who you want to go <laughs> Although it does make for some great footage. <laughs> all right, all right. So we're at number five. Five, it's one whole hand, five. Distribution, as your own punk record label. Distribution, it's a pain in the butt. Do you agree? Distribution is a huge pain in the butt, especially in the 21st century. Well, physical distribution is a pain in the butt. I guess I would say that, right, Charlie? Would you agree? Because I feel like nowadays, it's really fascinating how you don't even need a label to get on everything. You yeah. need to have a provider. You need to use, I'm a big fan of DistroKid because they, you, then you only have to pay an, one annual fee to get all of your music online. And then you just pay that annual fee to hold it up there. There are some other websites where you pay per release and then you could be spending like thousands of dollars if you're a label because every release costs you like a like hundred bucks and you have all these releases and with DistroKid, you just pay your one fee a year, and then it's distributed digitally on everything. So it's a great thing. But then when it comes to physical, it's really hard because back in the day, there were more, everybody, all you could do was sell your physical record. So there were people out there that would work with you because they, there's always a middleman. So like yep. you want to get that Warner Brothers distribution. You can't get Warner Brothers distribution. But... You know a guy who knows a guy who knows a guy, and then he gets you in the catalog. So he kind of gets you in the back door, and that's the way it was back in the 80s, in the 90s. Now that's you how, know what it is? Now, now what is it, Charlie? I'm going to read what I said to do for distribution. Really simple. You can start off self-distributing, okay, at your shows, at your local record stores, places like that. No problem. Exactly, yeah. But since you already have... Number one, remember that giant list of exposure. You throw that sucker everywhere. And you sell the hell out of that thing any way you can. If it's a punk band and they're crazy, drop a taco on the ground and eat it. How many times have I said that to you? Drop the taco on the <laughs> ground and 100. eat it. At least a hundred. At least a hundred. And then on the ground is the record right under the taco. Boom, perfect placement. Nice and simple. You should be able to gain sales faster than you realize. If you did number one, hardcore. Get every single group you could possibly find. Every reviewer, every podcast. Anybody in your area, have your fucking grandmother interview you. I don't care. Nice and simple. Honest, I mean, Charlie, that's, it's so true because I haven't done so much from a, a record label perspective because since I own my very small label that pretty much just puts out my band, Rodentia Records, it puts out the Dirty What is Rack. it again? Say it to the camera out loud. Rodentia Records. <laughs> and uh, since I have my own little small label, 
I've normally just focused on getting stuff done for my band, booking tours and all that stuff for my band. And what Charlie's saying is 100% true because I haven't done it so much from the promoting the release aspect, but I've played almost a thousand shows coast to coast in all 48 of the mainland states, and I did that through the Facebook groups. I would find out what venues. Whoa, 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 that's number six. That's number six? <laughs> you know, me. Number six, setting up a tour. If you're gonna be a record label, setting up a tour is very important. It's true. Are you jumping ahead of me for a I didn't know, man, I didn't know. Man. All right, now you can continue. I'm okay. Like really cut him off. So setting up a tour. So just as step one, where you have this list of all these groups, there's a lot of times the groups won't necessarily just be like DIY records Columbus, Ohio. It'll just be Columbus, Ohio DIY punk or punk rock Columbus, Ohio. Yep. And then you go to that group and you can find out when shows are happening. You can find out what bands are playing. And those are bands that could play with you. Those are venues that you could play. There's promoters that are sharing events to, the, to these Facebook pages. You can contact those promoters. And on the same page, especially if you're coming to that town, you can... Share your release. Tell them what you did. 100 shows, 100 days. <laughs> yeah, I booked 100 shows in 100 days. Trying to get the certificate from Guinness. Still, takes a while. 100 <laughs> shows, 100 days. They showed up at every one of them. What was it, 48 states or close to that? Oh, it was close. We did. I think we did like 42 and on that. Was, that and, and that was last year. Yeah, we did 42 states on the tour. And then we played all 48 last year. Yes. Yeah. Here twice. It was actually 101 or 102. Yeah. But he don't count us first, even though we were. We were number one on that tour, but we're like number 0.5. <laughs> All right, I'm going to read you what I have written down for All right, for sure, for sure. Keep it very local at first. You, you got to practice. Your band got to practice in front of an audience. Keep it local. One show per month, absolute minimum. They have to be willing to play. If they're not willing to play, especially in the early stages of, of them being signed to your label, what's the point? All merch goes through you, though, and that, that's coming up, too. Anyway, that's, that's the first thing. The other one is, is the next show, go out up to a 50-mile radius. This way, you're moving out, and you're building your brand in a, in a central hub, in a circle around you, a radius. Actually, I have a, there's a... Speak up. There's a re if you're going to start a record label, I'd say one thing that you need is sometimes you need resources to reference. So I'm gonna reference. There's a book called Tour Smart, which is definitely if you were gonna start an independent record label, you should definitely get a copy of Tour Smart, and then you should also get a copy of How to Ruin a Record Label by Larry Livermore, who founded the Lookout Records that put out Green Day and stuff like that. But anyhow, that's old school. Old school. You ready for new school? Yeah, that's what I mean. And uh, I was going to say, in Tour Smart, there's a concept, like you said, about the radius. In the book, it talks about the, the wheel method, where you want to have the spokes on a wheel. So you could have your general area, like we're in New Jersey. So that means you can try and play New York. You can try and play Philadelphia. You could maybe even try and branch out to, like, uh, like well, there's Northeastern PA. You could play Scranton. You could even maybe work your way out towards Pittsburgh. Is Baltimore it? isn't that far either. Baltimore isn't that far. Uh, Washington, D.C. isn't that far. Yeah. you got to look at all the general demographics. Delaware is not that far. And then it's all in the middle, the, the center of your wheel is your hometown. And you build that, that hometown following. Your job as a record label is getting them booked and tons of press. You have to put this thing everywhere, every single show they're going to play. You need to get that band working and moving nonstop. If they're playing one show a month, there better be at least five or six press opportunities before that show. And you better have that thing listed everywhere. Local radio station pages, newspapers, I don't care if you put it on Craigslist, Facebook, obviously, and Instagram and all the social media outlets, but you got to go above and beyond. You got to push like you've never pushed before. This is your record label. If you want to make it, you have to really freaking push. 
Now, there's also, there's plenty of Facebook groups about touring. Like he was saying, I have that written down too. Mingle, mingle like your life depends on it. Because it does. As you're going to book these shows, you need to know these people. Who can do what for you? What can you do for them in exchange? It all works out. You're in a network of people when you're in a Facebook group about touring. If you're not going to work with people, this isn't going to work. You have to get them tons of press. And where are you going to get the press from? Every single town you go into, I guarantee you, has a local podcast, has a local record store. Hang a flyer on a wall like we do. Do things for your local bands. Go into all these different places. I don't care if you go into your local gas station. Put it in their bathroom. Anywhere anybody's going to show up that's crazy and a punk, because you're talking about a punk record label, mm -hmm. put it everywhere a punk's going to be. <laughs> Am I wrong? No, you're not wrong. I was, I was going to say that um, the concept of, <laughs> the concept of like doing your part, that's the big thing I always tell everyone. That any independent artist, it's not just about you. It really isn't. Most bands that I've seen have gained success. A good example would be the Bouncing Souls yeah. from New Jersey. The Bouncing Souls are the nicest guys on the planet. As far as punk rock goes, because a lot of times punk rockers have egos and they can be kind of jerky. The Bouncing Souls are so salt of the earth. Because even I had an instance on the 100 Shows Tour where we had done some demos with uh, the guitar player from the Bouncing Souls. And he always said, if, if the Souls are ever on tour, hit us up. So I hit Pete up when we were on tour in Utah doing the 100 shows, and then they invited us on the tour bus, and they gave us a large portion of their rider from that night. So nice. we got all this food, and then the bass player, Brian, was like, here's 100 beers for your 100 shows. Like, he it gave was, you 100 beers? He gave us 100 Aww. beers, yeah. See, that's wild. So, and it's the whole thing. It's just from doing your part. Like, the Bouncing Souls have got at their point. And then even you look at Fat Mike, who runs one of the most successful punk rock record no effects, labels. Yeah. No effects. No effects. Fat Records was started by Mike Saw talented bands and he wanted to help them. He was like, this band's really good. They're a local band opening for us. Why don't I sign them and then I could put them national? It's like seeing someone that's talented and doing their part and you could be, if you want to start this label, you'd be like, well, I'm just some guy. Like I'm a 16 year old that loves music. Well, when you go to these all ages shows and you saw an awesome band from out of town, like a band from Arizona plays your hometown. Let's say you're from Let's say you're from, uh, what's it? You're from New Jersey, and a band from Arizona plays New Jersey, and you love them, and you want to sign them and put out their record, you can help them, because also, you're giving them a place to stay on the East Coast, you're giving them a home base on the East Coast, and they're from Arizona. So it's just always about helping people and, like, doing your part. Absolutely. You ready for number seven? Number seven! Number seven's lessons learned. Lessons learned. You learn from your mistakes. This is a tough one to swallow. Do not expect to make a profit from one band. Don't do it. Instead, be ready and looking and learning how to manage a second band on top of the first band. Now you're talking almost a year, year and a half out now. And you have to learn, you're gonna make so many mistakes and not even realize it until it comes time to do the second band, if you're still into this. Most people don't make it to step seven. They don't, they give up because it's not profitable enough. This is where your mistake comes in because now you have to duplicate the success. Not every band's going to be the same, but that list for number one, you have to have the world's biggest list and people have to like you and want to work with you. If you're an arrogant piece of poop like me, don't do it. I know better. I know better and I know business. I'm just saying, I don't want a record label. I'm too wild, I'm too crazy, but I'll take a record store and I'll sit in the back room and tell everybody else what to do and it'll work and make me a profit. Can you, can you beat that? Isn't that reality here? No, it's true. When, with the, uh, when you look at the reality of starting any type of 
small business, especially when if it's like like a sole proprietorship. Like, oh, if you're starting a record label, you're not gonna have a staff at Spark at, at first. If anything, you might have your girlfriend or boyfriend, and they love you enough that they'll help you, like stuff the records together and like fold the CDs and, and 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 figure out some of the orders and all this stuff you need like but again it's just gonna be you in the beginning and sometimes you could get so overwhelmed by just that one band it could be hard to take on the second band but if you're doing great and you feel like I got this you just gotta keep pushing because eventually you get it. how hard is it to manage your time time management oh. is Super important and lessons learned. Super important. Because you're going to figure out where you wasted most of your time. And believe me, you wasted a lot of time. You're going to cut that down for your second band yeah. while still working with the first band. Yeah. It's a guarantee. And if you can't do that and you can't see where you made your mistakes, it ain't going to work. Because it gets, with anything in life, just like... If you did one push-up right now and you never do push-ups, that one push-up could be really hard. But it's going to hurt. Start, it's going to hurt. But if you start doing a push-up every single day, then before you know it, you could do 100 push-ups in like 15 minutes. You know, you're not even going to think about it. But it's like you just got to do the step one. So you have that first band. Like I said, you could get overwhelmed with that first band. But again, it's just like that first pu a push-up. Like eventually when, if you had five, six bands and you have all this information that you gained from step one, like you have, you have a network and because you have this network, you're booking the tours. Maybe you have a good friend now that's part of your label. You have a staff and they're booking the tours and you're working on the PR and everything's going in motion. Then it gets easier. And then you could have 10 bands, 20 bands. It's just, you got to start with that first band and learn your lessons and then use it as like building blocks to build the rest of the house, the rest of the the label. You put your steps in place. You write it out. You literally write it out. And this is the core of your business. This is has everything to do with number, even before number one. The core of your business is everything. By the second, by the third, by the fourth band, you will have it running like a fine oiled machine. This is what we do first. This is how we find the band. This is how we get exposure for them. This is the tour. Right in a row, straight down, and if you don't do that, you're done. By the fourth band, you should have everything like a well-oiled machine running all around you. So now we're on to number eight and the final one. Making a profit. <laughs> Baby, that's last. Did you notice that? Making a profit is last because you can't care about that. It's last. So I have written down, reinvest in your business. Crucial to reinvest. If you made a profit, think about where that money will best suit your business. What do you think about reinvesting in the business? I would say that re reinvesting in the business is 100% mandatory. I think any small business owner would tell you in the beginning that it's like, you don't like, you sometimes don't see profit for five years. And then a lot of times, like if it's not within that three to five year bracket, you might want to try a different business. But in those first few years, you just are keep reinvesting because you're just trying to grow. You're trying to make the connections. You're trying to learn. You're trying to just become the most efficient business you have possible. At 16, if you're 16 right now to 20, by the time you're 25, by the time you're 30, this should work, 100%. If you push as hard as you possibly can on your number one, you'll go very far. You have to get that list. Yeah. You will beg, borrow, and steal from people. You need the reviews, you need the podcasts, you need journalists. You need everybody and anybody you could ever think of on that list. And you need to be able to work with them. And they need to be able to work with you. It's vice versa. Is there a lot of give and take in all of this, in your opinion? Um, I would say, yeah. I would say that like with give and take, it's just like, it's it's all part of a system. You know, it's, it's the whole thing that like, people aren't going to help you 
unless you help them. It's like always, it's, it's like I scratch your back, you scratch mine. Like just as like a microcosm. If I, with my label, I use mainly as a production company because the only band on my label is my band, but I produce a lot of live events through my label. And if a band from Florida booked my band, when they come up to New Jersey, I'm gonna book them. You know, I, I have to I have to reciprocate. And it goes I've had always. shows like that. With exactly. You. Yeah, where he's come to me and said, can so-and-so play here because they hooked me up down there I gotta hook them up up here. And I've been like, sure, Houston, no problem. Shit's always happened, but <laughs> am I wrong? No, it's true. Honestly, it's it's like it's just part of it's part of the network. It's part of the community. It's part of the system and how it just goes. Is that you aren't dealing with major labels. Is a major label, there's contracts. So if they don't like you, they don't have to like you because there's a contract and there's money involved and all that. But if it's independent, you're only as strong as your name and your reputation. Yep. Honestly. If it's just your And your record label name. Yeah, and your record label. You gotta have a good record Number label. Number two, name. remember. Number two. <laughs> now, I wanna give a pro tip. I'm nowhere near a freaking pro. But I'm gonna give you a pro tip. You don't have to go to Warner for distribution or Sony or Universal or any of them. Self distribution is great, but you can always go with a little bit less, a middleman on distribution to begin with a small record label. You can go to Alliance, URP, you can go to the smaller ones. Hell, I even think Ingram would put you out. You could go to Sound Whatever America. I, I forget the name of it right now, but they'll gladly put out your 7-inch. And they already have a couple hundred thousand people following them. If they put you on their page, chances are you'll sell five or six things, which is great to begin with. And it is really easy to gain middle management distribution. That's my pro tip. What do you think about that? Honestly, no, that's a, that's a hundred percent. That's a great piece of advice because if you look at, if you, if you have someone that's going to get you distributed, that's the big thing when it comes down. If you are, if you are trying to be an independent record label, the number one thing you do as a, do as a record label is since you aren't a musician, you're actually just a label, you know, you have to, no, I hear you. So, There's a phone ringing in the background. Yeah. You know how we do. <laughs> this is unedited pretty much. I know. But yeah, anyway, so I would say that I agree with you, Charlie, because since you're a label, you're not a musician, you're not worried about playing shows, your big thing is you're worrying about getting your artist in the hands of people that would want to listen to them. Yes. So if you can have a proper distributor, then... With step number one, you have your list, so you know a bunch of independent record stores throughout the country, and you could mail them a copy. Let's say they buy it from your personal web store that you have for your record label, but then when they want more, you could be like, we're, di we're distributed through so-and-so, and that makes you look good because they're getting all their other records from that when they're doing their orders at the end of the month, sure. so then they'll just do it, put another check mark next to your name. So yes, you might do a lot of the initial legwork, but once you get the ball rolling and people know who your band is and people are asking about it because there's write-ups and everything, then when they need to order it, they can just easily get it distributed to the, to the store. That first band, you better work harder for them than you've ever worked for yourself in your life because you need to learn every mistake you could possibly make and then fix them with the second band. It's reality. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, this is only covering how to. I didn't go into the business side of this. I didn't tell you about percentages and different things and how to go about doing that. All I am talking about in this video is the actual business. And who am I to talk about this? Absolutely nobody. <laughs> I'm a nobody. Five minutes of thought went into this and about half hour to write this. And then calling up Houston and being like, dude, come here, you own a record label. <laughs> and that's what it takes once you have your steps in place. Anything you would like to add? I would say 100%. This is a great list. Everything you've seen in this video could help you start a label. 
And one thing, you know, I would say I would do this. If I could throw in a pro tip, I would say the time management really is the big thing. So I can't stress this enough because I've struggled with time management my entire life. And you may say, oh, I don't struggle with time never management. Never shows up on time. <laughs> Love them though. You know, but like, you could be like, I've never been late for a show though. No, no, okay. <laughs> but, um, I can name it. <laughs> but I would say that time management is really important. You could be watching this video and be like, oh, it's like, oh, I, I have perfect time management, but I'm sure you're procrastinating something. Uh -huh. Everybody does. You know, we're just human. But there's one thing I could say that might help this, and it was a little off base, but something I learned recently. You should look up the Pomodoro method. It's something where you set a timer. So like when Charlie said in step one that you want like a million podcasts that you can contact. Find at first, world. at first, that could be really intimidating. You could you could want to give up after 20 or 30 of just Google stuff. But the Pomodoro method is something where you just set a timer. So you give yourself a basic time limit. You'd say, for 15 minutes, I'm going to do this given task. And this can go for anything in life. It's something, it's so simple that this would have maybe, I could be 10 steps ahead of where I am with my band and my label if I just knew this like five years ago, but I didn't. So if you just set a timer and you do, you follow what Charlie's telling you, you could do anything. You could even apply, like literally, it's like what he said, it's like, even if you wanted to sell bracelets, you go to the Facebook groups, you find the bracelet podcasts, you go to the, you go to art shows, you book a bracelet tour for, for an art show tour. You know, it's you can use this. It's just business. It's just business. I set up a business. Boom. And if you manage your time and just do it a little step at a time, you can just do it and like start with like, I'm just going to do 15 minutes. And you're like, wow, that 15 minutes, I was so productive. Now I'm going to do another 15. Or I'm going to do an hour. And then before you know it, you have, know all these people. You have built this network and the sky's the limit. If you have any other business questions that you want me to actually take serious, let me know in the comments. I'm telling you. <sighs> Thank you, Houston. Houston of the Dirty Rats, check out his band, his page, he just released a music video. It's he, awesome. He poops on himself. We're I'm on Spotify. Subscribe. Subscribe. <laughs> Spotify, what? Finally, he's on Amazon now. He's put himself everywhere. He's the man. Done? Are we done? I don't know. Woo! <laughs> hey, Sean, I got a very important question. How would you start a punk record label from your bedroom? Online. <laughs> you made that sound real easy. Sure. All right. You said it was a simple question. That's my simple answer. Beautiful. I loved every second of it. I got a very important question. What's that? If you had to open up mm -hmm. a punk record label from your bedroom, okay. what would you do first? Um, The first thing I do, the very first, is... Aliens. Hmm. There's so many steps that I can think of. I don't know which one should be first. Hmm. hmm. Think I should go through some steps? I think so. All right. I think that'd make a hell of a video. Mm-hmm. What?